Good morning. Happy Sunday. I am happy to be back with you. You know, when most people think of the book of Revelation, the stuff that usually comes to mind are the psychedelic visions, the cosmic battles, the cataclysmic judgments. And certainly the book of Revelation includes all of those things and a whole lot more. But before John gets to any of the really cool stuff, he takes what might seem like to us a weird detour in chapters 2 and chapter 3. And in these two sections, these two chapters of the book of Revelation, he relays messages from Jesus to seven first century local churches. Now, because of how like fantastic and apocalyptic the rest of the book of Revelation is, there can be this impulse inside of us to just like skip chapters two and three, the letters to these churches that we don't know anything about. That's not exciting. Let's get to the really good stuff, right? There could be this impulse to want to get ahead into the more wild and fantastic things in this book. But you know, that would be a mistake. And we're not going to do that. Instead, we are going to spend our time together today talking about the seven letters to the seven churches of Asia in the book of Revelation. The reason we're going to do that is because these words from Christ to these ancient congregations actually offer a lot of comfort and a lot of challenge to those of us living in the 21st century. That these are not merely words to some people that lived a long time ago on the other side of the planet, but we're going to discover that they actually have a lot of value for us here today in the 21st century in Canada. In fact, if you've ever wondered, how healthy is my faith really? Like how alive, how vibrant, how fruitful is my faith actually? Today in chapters 2 and 3 from the book of Revelation, we're going to get a diagnostic tool, a way to kind of evaluate where we're at spiritually and to discover just how healthy is my faith. Now, before we read this section of Revelation, let me remind you of the things that we've talked about over the first couple of weeks, okay? I told you that the book of Revelation was written by the Apostle John in the latter half of the first century, that it's an apocalypse which is a genre of writing that is highly symbolic. And what, what I mentioned to you in week one was that it exists not to unveil the future. The message of Revelation, the truth of Revelation, is not so much about what is to come, but what is now. I told you that Revelation was written not to unveil how the world will end, but instead to unmask how the world runs. John is trying to show you what our world is really like just below the surface. And so it not only speaks about some distant point called the end times, but it speaks about here and now. Whenever and wherever God's people might live in the world or throughout history, John is speaking to them, which means he is speaking to you and to I. Now, we also said that Revelation was written to uh, a group of fearful and persecuted Christians in the first century. That with, with all of the pressures and difficulties and threats and danger that they were facing, God offers them a word of comfort through the revelation of John. And so if the point was to offer comfort, any readings of revelation that you and I might do today that do not end in faith but instead end in fear are wrong. If revelation makes you scared, you are not reading it rightly. Now, I told you a moment ago, we often want to skip over chapters 2 and 3 and get to the wild stuff, but you can't understand the wild stuff. You can't understand the symbols, the metaphors, the pictures that John is going to use without reading chapters 2 and 3 because it situates it in a particular time and place, and it will help you to make sense of all of the symbols that he's going to use in chapters 4 to 22. Okay, let's, ju let's jump in here. Revelation chapter number 1, we're going to read for a moment verses 9 to 11. This is the introduction of the uh, book of Revelation, and we've read this before, but it's okay. It's worth covering again. Verse number 9, the scripture says, I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering and in God's kingdom and in the patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. He says, I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. Now, it was the Lord's day, and I was worshiping in the spirit. Suddenly, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast, and it said this. Now, pay attention. Write in a book everything you see, and then send it to the seven churches of Asia in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, um, 
these, these seven churches form kind of the basis of the next two chapters and the letters that John, uh, I- I- he passes on to them from Jesus. Although these are called very often the seven churches of Asia, Asia in the first century had a little bit of a different meaning than it does today, okay? So in the first century, the, the Romans occupied basically all of the Mediterranean world, and they had an, an official province that was called Asia. I can actually put a map here on the screen for you. And rather than, as in our modern day, Asia encompassing like, uh, uh, encompassing like China and Taiwan and the Philippines and things like that, Instead, Asia was this area here. This is modern-day Turkey. So if you look at this map, you might recognize the boot of Italy over here, the next peninsula down, that's ancient Greece. And then if we go across the Aegean Sea, we get over here to Turkey, ancient Turkey. And this was the Roman province of Asia. So when John is addressing these churches in Asia, he is talking to ancient, what we would call Middle Eastern or Turkish believers. Now, he writes letters to seven seven specific congregations. And if we zoom into the province of Asia, as we've done over here on this map, you can see a few things. One, Patmos is the island at which John is exiled. He's been banished to this spot in the sea. There's nothing there. He's got nothing to do. So he decides to write letters to the seven churches. One of the things that should stand out to you as you look at this particular map is that the seven churches of Asia that are addressed in chapters two and three are incredibly close together. Okay, the distance between the two that are furthest apart, Pergamum and Laodicea are probably the furthest apart. The distance between those two is less than 150 kilometers. That's the distance from here to Red Deer. So we're talking about seven churches that are in a very, very small geographic uh, uh, place. Okay, but what I love about this is that although they're all so close together, they spoke the same language, wore the same clothes, lived in basically the same culture. Jesus doesn't lump them all together and give them a letter as one. Instead, he addresses all seven congregations uniquely and personally. Hey, can I remind you that God knows you individually, that when God speaks, he will speak to you and your exact circumstances, not to your neighbor's circumstances, not to your pastor's circumstances, but God sees exactly what you are going through. And when he brings a word, he will bring a word to you every bit as much as he did to the churches in Asia. Now, uh, we, we don't have time to read each of these seven letters today, okay? That would take far too long. But luckily, all seven letters follow the same basic format. Now, the, the details are going to change, but they actually follow the exact same structure every time. I've, I've put this here on the screen so you can kind of track with me. It always begins by addressing the church. So to the church at Ephesus, write this letter. At the chur- to the church at Thyatira, write this, okay? Then it moves on to uh, the Jesus revealing himself as the author of the letter. This is really important. It's not John who is writing to the seven churches. It is Jesus who has a word for these seven churches. Now, when Christ reveals himself, he doesn't say to all seven of the churches, this is from Jesus, your Lord and Savior. No, every single time he reveals himself in a way that demonstrates his power, his authority, his glory, And he reveals himself in a way that is specifically helpful to each of the seven churches. You're going to see what I mean in just a moment. Afterwards, he offers uh, each congregation specific praise. He says, hey, you guys are doing great in this area. Keep it up. Then he gives them a word of critique. And he says, however, things are not all perfect. In fact, I've noticed this and this and this, and you need to get better in this area. Then he gives them a warning. And he says, if you don't change this, if you don't shore up this part of your faith, then there will be consequences. But if you do, he ends by giving them a reward, a promise. And what you'll see is that the rewards are tied into the warnings. The rewards are tied into the weakness. So whatever struggle they might be facing, God promises to give them what they need if they will merely turn to him. So let me give you uh, an example. Okay, we're going to read the last of the seven letters. We'll just read one this morning. We'll read the last of the seven letters, the one to the church in Laodicea. This is recorded for us in chapter 3, verses 14 to 22. We're going to read the whole thing. 
in verse 14, uh, Jesus says, write this letter to the angel or the messenger. Some people interpret this as pastor of the church in Laodicea. That's number one. He identifies the audience. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things that you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And yet you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be truly rich. Also buy white garments from me so you will not be shamed by your nakedness and buy ointment for your eyes so that you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. And in verse 22, he ends the same way he ends every letter to the seven churches. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, you can see all six elements of, the, of these letters here to the, uh, to the Laodiceans. Let's put it back on the screen. Next chart here. You'll see that he begins by identifying the Laodiceans as the recipients. He calls himself the faithful witness. He is faithful even when the Laodiceans are not. You might have noticed it didn't really sound like he praised the Laodiceans for a whole lot. That's true. This is the only one of the seven churches that doesn't get any praise for doing anything right. They're kind of all over the place, and none of it is good. He gives them the critique. He says that they are lukewarm. They're neither spiritually hot nor spiritually cold. They're like a room temperature glass of water. Now, I know that's kind of weird imagery, right? But understand it doesn't occur in a vacuum. Okay, the Laodiceans, Laodicea, the ancient city, was known across the Roman Empire for having some of the worst water around. Okay, so you might remember from history class that one of the technologies Romans developed that enabled them to spread civilization so far was something called aqueducts. So they would go to the mountains, they would go to lakes, they would go to springs and rivers, and they would take natural sources of water, and they built these concrete channels that would travel long distances through the wilderness, and it would deliver water like an ancient above-ground piping system directly to the cities uh, in the Roman Empire. Now, because of the way uh, Laodicea's geography works, the closest sources of spring water were far, far away. And so, of course, like the water would come out clear, cool, and refreshing in the mountains. But by the time it had traveled through these open aqueducts miles across the countryside and it got into the town of Laodicea, the sun had warmed it to the point that it was just like, ugh. You know what I mean? Like a hot cup of water is delicious. A cold cup of water is especially delicious. But room temperature, tepid, nobody wants that. It's not good. It should be cold or it should be hot. It shouldn't be anywhere in the middle. So Jesus uses this very well-known picture in their local context to describe their spiritual state. Now, why were they so lukewarm? What was it about them that made them neither hot nor cold? Jesus reveals that to us. He says it's because you're too wealthy. <laughs> you have too much money. Laodicea was an incredibly wealthy city, and it led people to be comfortable and safe and not feel like they needed God at all. The reason that they were so wealthy is that a, the, uh, the city of Laodicea was home to an ophthalmic school, a, a school that helped people with eye issues in the ancient world. It was the best place to go anywhere in the Roman world if you wanted to be treated for eye diseases. And the reason for that is because in the countryside, all the rocks in that area are very high in zinc. And zinc is actually a chemical. It's, a, it's a, 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 a chemical that has the ability to heal, in particular, eye diseases. It's still used in many eye ointments and treatments even today. And so they were successful at treating eye issues in the first century, and that made them very famous, and it made them a lot of money. People would travel from all over the Roman Empire to come to Laodicea specifically to have their eye issues addressed by the medicines that they created there. Now, if you understand all of this context, Jesus' letter to the Laodicea and starts to make a lot of sense. He calls them lukewarm because they hate lukewarm water. And Jesus says, I hate lukewarm spirituality. 
He, they say, we're wealthy and we don't have need of anything. And Jesus says, you don't realize how broke you really are. You're rich physically, but you are not rich spiritually. In fact, your wealth has made you apathetic about the things that really matter. And so he says, you walk around in your fancy, expensive clothes, and you don't realize that actually you're naked. He, he, says, he says, you think you see everything so clearly, you're helping everybody else to see so clearly, but in reality, you're just as blind as they are. You need to get ointment from me instead of giving ointment to other people so that we can cleanse and heal your eyes and you can see how things really are in the city of Laodicea. I love this. Like, these messages to the churches are so unique and so direct. Like, we see other examples of this when he's talking to the city of Pergamum. He says, you guys, your city is the home of Satan's throne. Well, why does he say that? Is it just like a really bad city? No, Pergamum was the very first Roman city that built a temple for the imperial cult. So the first place in the Roman Empire that they ever started worshiping the Caesars as literal gods was in Pergamum. And so he says, you guys have the throne of Satan inside of your town, okay? We, when you read these letters, it can feel kind of, I don't know, abstract and weird, but God is addressing very particular issues for these particular Christians. Now, the other church sixes, uh, the other six churches all follow the exact same format. I'm going to put them here on the screen. You can take a photo of this because we're not going over all of it, okay? But if you were to read this, you would discover that Jesus gives them the introduction, the authorship. He praises them. He critiques them. He gives them a warning, and he promises them a reward. You can go through that list and, again, see what the message is to each one of those seven churches. Now, I promised you this morning— that Revelation 2 and Revelation 3 were going to be super practical, which might be kind of hard to believe at this point, right? Because here we are talking about ancient aqueducts and eye drops, and you're like, I don't know what this means to me, bro. I get it. So let me summarize what Jesus is going to say throughout the book of Revelation, but it is specifically encapsulated by chapters 2 and chapter 3. The message that Jesus is trying to communicate at this moment to the first century Christians is this. Jesus calls his people to worship, work, witness, and wait for his second coming. Four things he calls them to do. Worship, work, witness, and wait for his second coming. Now, as it turns out, this is also our assignment. In the middle of an unsteady and ungodly world, God calls all of his children to worship, work, witness, and wait for his second coming coming now when i say worship guys i'm not referring to like the the 13 or 15 minutes on a sunday morning where we stand and sing songs together on sunday okay it includes that but it's way more than that so for instance when jesus addresses the church in ephesus he tells them that they have lost or left their first love he essentially says to them their worship is waning their worship is is faltering. Jesus is not supreme in their lives. Yeah, he's important, but he's not most important. Jesus is like a part of their lives, but he's not the foundation of their entire lives. Later in the book of Revelation, John is going to highlight the fact that everybody will worship something. Everybody will worship something. You might be here today and you're like, I'm an atheist. I don't worship anything. That's not true. You may not worship the same God that I do, but you worship something. The way that John frames it is that everyone is either going to worship the lamb of Revelation 5 or they're going to worship the beast of Revelation 13. You will worship something. And so unless, according to John anyway, unless we consciously choose to worship Christ, then we will fall under the control of a demonically controlled world. That, that's the way it works. We will worship something. We will obey and follow and give our allegiance to the lamb or to the beast. Now, because we are Christians, our eyes are opened. We red-pilled it, baby. We're wide awake. We know. We understand how the world really works. And so we choose to give our allegiance to Jesus and not to the world. We choose to give our allegiance to Christ and not something else. He is the one who truly deserves all of our praise, all of the glory, all of our obedience. As the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter number 3, I count everything else as garbage compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. My friends, you were put here on earth not to earn a lot of money, 
not to get rich and famous, not to have as much fun before you could die. No, you were put here on earth to exalt and spotlight Jesus in everything you do, to worship the only one who is truly worthy to receive our worship. Worship is not three songs and a prayer on Sunday morning. It is a 24-7 lifestyle for a follower of Jesus. And so Christ calls his people, whether first century or 21st century, to focus on worshiping him until he returns. But not only does he tell us to live a life of worship, he call, also calls us to work until he returns, to work until he returns. In fact, this is specifically what he praises the church in Ephesus for. He says in chapter 2, verse 1, I have seen your hard work and patient endurance. He is pleased by their hard work and their patient endurance. Now, you might think that's kind of an unnecessary command, right? We've all got bills to pay, so we all understand we need to work. It's not like many of us today are not working at all. But actually, I think this is a necessary reminder. This is something that ancient Christians have struggled with. And hey, we're going to discover that modern Christians still struggle with this as well. You know, one of the reasons that the Apostle Paul wrote 2 Corinthians is because he wrote 1 Corinthians, which I know sounds very obvious, but stick with me for just a moment, okay? For, I, I'm sorry, I said Corinthians, I meant Thessalonians, but the joke is still the same. <laughs> Second Thessalonians, First Thessalonians. So look, he writes the first letter to the Thessalonian church, and the whole focus of that letter is, guys, Jesus is coming back. Live with a sense of urgency. Don't get too complacent. Don't, don't think that this life is all that matters. The next one is the real one, the life and eternity to come. Don't lose sight of that. Live in light of it every day. And the Thessalonians said, okay, we'll do it. And so they gave up on their earthly lives. Literally, Christians in Thessalonica were quitting their jobs. They were leaving their spouses. They were stopping to pay their bills. And they were just sitting around waiting for Jesus to appear in the sky. Any day now. So then Paul has to write them the letter of 2 Thessalonians. And he's like, all right, good job, guys. However, we can't be so heavenly minded that we are no earthly good. We, we can't sit around and wait for Jesus to come and pretend like we are not supposed to work in the here and now. God has called us to do both. So he talks to them, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3, verses 10 to 12. He says this, even while we were with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. Yet we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's business. We command such people and urge them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and work to earn their own living. First Timothy chapter number five, verse eight, the apostle Paul says, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Deadbeat dad, you listening? First Thessalonians chapter number four, verses 11 and 12, we're told to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anyone. Paul, uh, Jesus really, but Paul as well, calls Christians in the first century to work, to be productive with your life, not to waste the moments that you have been given. But it's not just ancient people who made this mistake. I was alive during Y2K. Anybody else? Okay. There are documented cases of Christians who were so convinced that Jesus was coming back on January 1st, 2000, that they quit their jobs, they stopped paying their mortgage, they racked up a ton of credit card debt because they thought, I'm not going to be around to be responsible for it. And how wrong they were. This is not something that just weirdo end times people have dealt with. I was actually counseling a guy here in Connect who serves on our dream team recently. And he said, you know, Dan, I'm struggling because I look at my life and I don't really feel like I've accomplished all the things that I should by this point. I'm in my mid-30s and I don't have a career. I don't have a, a wife or even a girlfriend. There's no kids. I don't feel like I have much of a future. I have committed myself to God and yet I don't feel like God has given me any of the things that I have trusted him for. And so I had to start asking him some questions. And I said, okay, you want a career, right? Okay, did you, have you gone to school for, to get training in the career? No, 
Okay, have you applied for any of those jobs? No, I just thought God would provide it. He, w- he would give me, I'm trusting him. So God, you open the doors. And I'm like, wait a sec, a, a bachelor's degree is not just going to appear out of thin air. Like if you want training, if you want, you know, a degree, if you want a career, you have to actually put in some work in order to get it, right? Even as you trust God, you still work while you wait for him to provide. He said he didn't have a girlfriend, doesn't have any romantic prospects. And I'm like, okay, have you asked a girl out lately? No, no, that's just weird, man, and I don't want to be too forward and stuff like that. Bro, if you want a wife, you got to shoot your shot, okay? Jesus calls us to live by faith and to work every single day. It's a both and. It's not an either or, and we get ourselves into trouble when we think that God only wants us to work as if everything depends on us, or we only are supposed to have faith as if everything only depends on him. It is both and. We are called to work as we wait. Jesus also calls his people to witness until he returns. We worship, we work, we witness. Now, witness in our modern usage typically means sharing the gospel, trying to convert somebody to our faith. And that's certainly part of it. But can I show you something really, really interesting from the book of Revelation? Okay. The, the word witness occurs many, many times throughout the book of Revelation. It occurs throughout the New Testament. What I'm about to show you is true in every single one of these cases. But just as a small sampling, in chapter 1, verse 5, Jesus is called the faithful witness. Uh, in Revelation 11, we read of the two witnesses. In Revelation 7, 18, we read of the countless witnesses who surround the throne of God. Let's put the next slide up here. You know, in Greek, the word that gets translated as witness is the word martus, from which we get the English word martyr. This is true every single time the word witness occurs in the scripture. And you shall be my witnesses. We don't understand what Jesus is really saying there. From Revelation's perspective, to be a witness is to lose your life for your testimony to Christ. Now look, all right, this is not going to get weird, I promise. (laughs) The odds that any of us would be under true physical persecution for our faith are essentially zero, at least in Canada right now. And praise God for that. Let's not manufacture a persecution. You don't want it, folks. You're not about that life. Thank God that we have a measure of peace, (coughs) excuse me, in our society. But that has not been true throughout history, and that is not true for our brothers and sisters in different parts of the world today. Sociologists estimate that somewhere around 70 million Christians have been martyred for their faith in the last 2,000 years. 70,000 people have been put to death in various places and times because they are committed to following Jesus. Now, as hard as what I'm about to uh, tell you to believe actually is, I need you to listen. Of the 70 million that have been estimated to be martyred for their Christian faith in the last 2,000 years, 45 million of them have died since 1900. We live in the most dangerous times for Christians ever. Researchers generally agree that around the world, again, we don't understand this because we live in such a safe society, but around the world, more Christians have been martyred in the last 100 years than the previous 1,900 years combined. So when Jesus says that, hey, your, your life could be under threat for your faith in me, that's probably not true for us, but it certainly is true for a lot of others. And who knows, it could be true of us one day as well. Now, we're incredibly fortunate that we don't live under threat for, you know, the threat of death for our testimony to Jesus. But listen, we cannot forget that one of the central calls of following Jesus is to die to self daily. Okay, we think of martyrdom this way. They are going to kill me for my faith in Jesus. You know how Christ frames it most often? You're going to kill you in order to follow Jesus. Woo! Okay. Christ said in the book of Luke, anyone who wants to follow me must take up their cross to follow me. 1 Corinthians 15, 31. Paul said that in order to follow Jesus, I die daily. The book of Romans calls us living sacrifices. Colossians 3, 3 says that when you were saved, you died and your life was hidden in Christ. Galatians 2, 20. I have been crucified with Christ. So it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives within me. Christ calls us to witness for him here on earth, to lay down our lives so that we can spotlight Jesus. John the Baptist said, I have to decrease so that he can increase. We are 
are called to live as witnesses of Jesus, to use our lives and, hey, in some extreme cases, even our deaths, so that people can see Jesus through us. Worship, work, witness. Finally, Jesus challenges Christians both in the first century and the 21st century to wait for his second coming. He, he tells the church in Thyatira, one of the seven churches, he says, hold tightly to your faith as you await my return. Waiting in this context doesn't mean kind of like sitting around like any day now, where's he at? Still waiting. No, no, no. It means to await. It means to expect something, to eagerly anticipate it, to long for it, to desire it. The best thing that could happen today would be Jesus came back. The best thing that could happen to the world is that he returns for every eye to see and every knee to bow and every tongue to confess that Christ is Lord. Second Peter chapter number three, Peter says this, since everything around us is going to be destroyed in God's judgment, what holy and godly lives you should live looking forward to the return of Christ and even hurrying it along. I don't even know what we can do to hurry it along, but he says there's a way on that day. God will set the heavens on fire. Even the elements of earth will melt away in flames. By the way, the last message in this series, we're going to talk about the new heavens and the new earth, the destruction of everything and the recreation of it all. He says, but we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth, as he promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. Second Timothy chapter number four, verse eight. Paul says, there is a crown of righteousness that awaits me, but not me only, but for all those who long for Christ's appearing. Do you know the final words that Jesus ever spoke in the Bible? Revelation chapter number 22, verse 20. He says, behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me. To which John responds, amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Now look, I realize some of you are sitting here thinking like soon, quickly. Brother, it's been 2,000 years. I'm not sure he's coming back. But don't forget the words of 2 Peter chapter number 3. He says, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. We actually saw this verse quoted a lot in reference to the opening ceremonies of the Olympics, but we'll leave that alone. Notice what he's talking about when he talks about mockers and scoffers. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is just like a day. The Lord isn't really slow about his promise, is something. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. The day of the Lord will come unexpectedly as a thief. The heavens will pass away with a terrible noise. The very elements of earth themselves will disappear in fire. Everything on earth will be laid bare under God's judgment. Listen, the return of Christ, just as the book of Revelation at large, should not be something that produces fear in us. It would literally the, be the best thing that could happen today. When you come to understand that, you don't dread the return of Christ. You don't fear the return of Christ. You await the return of Christ. You, you're like, yes, come today, Jesus. Today would be a good day for you to show back up. We echo the words of the famous hymn that says, Lord, haste the day when our faith will be sight. We long for the appearance of our Savior. We long for him to flash across the sky like lightning east from west. This is the great hope of our faith, that one day Jesus will return and he will put right everything that's gone wrong. We worship, we work, we witness, and we wait. Now, if you were to evaluate your faith today in the 21st century, in light of the framework that God has given these churches in the first century, how does it look? Like, how does your worship look right now? How sincerely and passionately do you love Christ? Maybe, like the church at Ephesus, you've lost your first love. Like, you started so passionate. You had so much zeal, man. You, you couldn't wait to be at church on Sunday. And Jesus was the most important thing. You read the word all the time. You couldn't shut up about him. He was everything to you. And over time, it tailed a bit. You got, you got knocked down by life a few times. You felt like God wasn't there for you when you needed him. And it's not like you've lost your love, but you've lost your first love. You don't love him like you did. Can I challenge you return? Can I challenge you recover what you had in the beginning? Strengthen your faith. Today would be a wonderful day to recommit yourself to Jesus.
to restart your relationship with God. More practically, how's your, relation, uh, how's your uh, worship rather on Sundays? Like, worship is certainly more than our singing time, but how is it during singing time? Are, are you singing to Jesus as if he deserves your glory and worship? Are you singing to him with all of your passion and zeal? Do you sing to him? Do you shout? Do you get just as excited or more excited for him than you do the stampeders or the flames? How's your worship? When others are clapping and singing and, and engaging, are you hands in your pocket, quiet, sullen, hoping this thing will end? Please don't do a fourth song today. How is your worship? Clap your hands. Come close instead of hiding in the back. Engage. Like, give him the worship that he's due. What if Jesus loved you as much as you love him? Oh, God, please never let that be the case. How's your work? I'm not asking if you have a job, because I know most of you do. You kind of have to. The real issue is whether you're working in any intentional way for God's kingdom. Are you working to benefit, serve, and expand God's kingdom in any way? formal way. Can I just ask a blunt question? Why do so many of you continue to refuse to serve on the dream team? I, I, don't, I don't get it. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, I don't want to beat anybody up here or anything like that, but too many of us are willing to consume God's blessings and not contribute to his mission. Something's wrong there. If you want to consume blessings and not contribute to the mission, it's not going to work. It's not going to work for you. It's not going to work for us. So, like, I, I, there are some of you that are here in the room right now, and you have a calling to serve and connect kids. But either you're unaware or unwilling to say yes to God's calling. And our, our kids' ministry suffers, and, hey, you suffer as a result of saying no to the calling that you know is there. There are people that are in the audience right now, and you could play bass or you could play drums or keys as good as anybody else up here or close enough anyway. But you've been content to sit on your hands and not use the gifts that you've developed. You'll go play in the bar on Friday night, but you won't come to church and use your gifts to honor Jesus. How's your work? Next, next week, we kick off the next round of growth track. Guys, it's time. Like, it's time to get plugged in. It's time to get involved. It is time to work for the benefit and the sake of the kingdom. How's your witness? How's your witness? When was the, the, the last time you shared your faith with somebody who doesn't share your faith? When was the last time outside of these walls where it's safe that you brought up the name Jesus? When was the last time that you lived in such a way that people saw Jesus in you and through you? You know, Romans says faith comes by hearing the word of God. There's this old quote that's often attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. He didn't really say it, but it doesn't matter. It's like one of those internet things, right? Anyway, the quote goes something like this. Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. Hey, can I tell you something? Words are always necessary. Actions are necessary and words. It's not one or the other. It's both and. If you have words and not deeds to back it up, you're a hypocrite. If you have deeds but not words to back it up, they're just going to think you're a nice person. We put words and deeds together, and suddenly we have a witness for the people who are around us. The book of Romans says this. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. But how shall people hear unless someone tells them? Witnessing isn't about like memorizing gospel presentations and, and answering every atheist objection. Witnessing is letting your light so shine before men that they see your good deeds and they glorify your Father in heaven. No matter who you are, no matter what stage of faith you are at, no matter what you do for a living, no matter what neighborhood you live in, you can do this. You can do it, and you have to do it for the sake of the world and for the sake of the mission. Finally, how's your waiting? When was the last time you thought about the return of Christ? Does the second coming fill you with anxiety or excitement? Do you realize that what you are truly longing for, the thing that you ultimately need in life is not a spouse or a promotion or healing or whatever. What you really need is the triumphant return of the King of Kings. And so God calls us to long for that, to pray for it, to hasten the day, speed its coming in some way, shape, or form, because the return of Jesus, as we'll see in a few weeks, is the best promise that the scriptures have given to any of us. Oh God, I pray in this moment that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. I pray that you would help us to do these things, to worship, God, to work, to witness, to wait. God, help us not to waste the lives that we've been given. We've been blessed by you in more ways than we could ever enumerate. 
And so, God, not as a way of earning your love or your favor, as Kyle shared even at the front end of our, our announcements this morning. We do these things because you love us. We do them because you have saved us. We do them because we want to live in your kingdom. We want to expand it here on earth. We want other people to come to realize just how wonderful you really are. So I pray, God, this would be a church of passionate worship. Oh, God, give us a worshiper's heart. Every Sunday, every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, help us to be workers. When there's a need to say, yes, I'll serve, I'll help, I'll do what's necessary. Oh, God, make us witnesses. I pray that everywhere we go, Jesus would just be leaking out of us in word and in deed. We, people couldn't be around us without being in your presence. Oh, God, help us to wait, to await your return, to count it as the great joy every single day. We have hope and optimism. We've read the end of the book, and we know you win. Thank you for that promise. Now help it to fuel and encourage us every single day. We love you for these messages, Jesus. We need them every bit as much as the seven churches in the first century. So help us to hear what the Spirit says to the churches and to be obedient to it. We pray this in your name. Amen.